How many know that God will do it again? Thank you, Jesus. Father in heaven, today we thank you that you've done it in times past. When we look back over our lives, we think things over. We all can agree that God, you have been good. In the good times, you've been good. Even in the bad times, you've been good. We thank you for being God and God all by yourself. And Lord, we thankful that you didn't just do it in the past, but we're so grateful that you'll do it again. So now, Lord, as we look to your word, we pray that your sweet Holy Spirit and your sweet heavenly dove will tabernacle a little while longer with us. Please, I pray, remove all that should prevent me from speaking to your people today. Use me one more time, I humbly ask, as an instrument of your peace. As I stand between heaven and earth, between the living and the dead, I pray that you would make me as a fork, but you be the food. Make me like a straw, but you be the juice. Make me like a mailman, but you be the mail. Make me like a pianist, but you be the piano. And Father, tune our hearts to sing thy praise. We will be careful to give you all the praise. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And all God's people say, amen and amen again. Certainly grateful for the worship of today, for our praise team, and for Brother Odin, who've led us in song so wonderfully. For our musicians who have led out, we praise God for you. For all those who I call brother and sister in Christ, God bless you. I'm certainly grateful for the time we've spent together so far in the Speak Life Spiritual Revival. I can't speak for anybody else, but I've been blessed so far. And the Lord has been doing a mighty thing. We certainly praise God for the young men and the, their sister who's gotten baptized today and for what God is getting ready to do in your life and what he's already done. Praise God for my good friend, Pastor Warner Richards and for his dear wife and for the impact and influence they've had on my life and ministry. And I'm always glad to have my wife, my First Lady Kelly, with me. And I thank you all for allowing her to travel with me. Today I want to point your attention to the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And there we'll read chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And I want us in that chapter, I highlight verses 9 uh, through 16. Matthew chapter 21, verses 9 through You found it. Let me invite you to stand to your feet as we read today. Matthew chapter 21, verses 9 through 16. And I'll read in your hearing. The Bible says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. 
And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased and said unto him, hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, yea, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. Today we're speaking under the topic, the bigger my problems, the bigger my praise. The bigger my problems, the bigger my praise. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There is a danger that the identity of the Christian church is in trouble today. It is not that people are losing their health because of Christianity. It is not that people are losing their wealth or their jobs because of Christianity. No one is suffering real persecution because of Christianity today, at least not in, our, in America. Uh, but the danger is that the identity of the Christian church is in trouble because there are many who claim to be a Christian without having to show any proof of their claim. Uh, most employees who work at maximum security facilities, they have to provide proof in order to be granted access uh, to the facility. Uh, but many in our world today claim that they are Christians uh, without having to provide legitimate proof. Long gone are the days when people would threaten you to renounce your faith or die. Uh, we have not seen that in this part of the world. Therefore, let me suggest, and you don't have to agree with me, but let me suggest that it is easier to be a Christian now than it was a thousand years ago. I remember when I played on my basketball team for uh, the church where I grew up, Brooklyn Faith, we had a, a strong basketball team in the junior league and and and, and I, I had a special position on the team I was on the team uh, to make sure that while my uh, teammates were playing uh, the bench won't fly away <laughs> that was my job I, I sat there and I made sure that the wind won't take the bench I, I, I looked at the end of the season and I saw that I had an accumulative uh, two minutes and 36 seconds of playtime. No, I didn't mean in one game. I mean for the whole season, uh, two minutes and 36 seconds. My job was to make sure the bench didn't go anywhere. I, I, I made sure uh, for, for the whole season, I never had to wash my uniform. To this day, it still smells good because I didn't bust, I, I, didn't, I didn't sweat or anything. I, I, I was I was I was what you call a bench warmer um, and the interesting thing every time we won a game the coach would take us to get uh, pizza to celebrate winning the game and 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 I would I would eat the pizza with the team even though I did absolutely nothing and the danger that the Christian church faces in 2016 is that we got a whole bunch of bench warmers who are not on the battlefield doing little to no work for the kingdom, but yet uh, when it's time to go to the pizza party. In many of our churches, we have complacent, bench-warming church members who claim to be Christians, but have absolutely no proof of their claim. Now, please understand today that when I speak about proof, I'm not talking about some cataclysmic, loud, main attraction, everybody look at me type of event. I'm simply saying that there are folk who have been in here longer than they've been out there, uh, but they still do the things they used to do out there, although they've been hanging out in here for so long. Y'all might as well hold on, I'm going to rock the boat a bit today. As many, many, many things have been going on in church that when non-believers see these church members who refer to themselves as Christians carrying on with, uh, it makes them stop and evaluate whether they even want to join the distasteful situation we call church. Let me suggest to us this afternoon that the identity of a true Christian is in following Jesus. 
That's what Christianity is all about. And, and we got too many folk who believe in churchianity and not enough who believe in Christianity. Uh, you've got to understand that the true Christian knows Jesus for their self. It is not about what uh, the preacher said. They, they know Jesus for their self. They, 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 you know, they, you could find my driver's license and on my driver's license, you could learn a whole bunch of facts about me. You could learn my eye color by reading my driver's license. You could learn my address from reading my driver's license. You could even learn how tall I am from reading my driver's license. But it's not until you get to know me that you know what my favorite food is. You know what makes me laugh. You know the things that would hurt me and the things that make me happy and the danger, not Linden, but the, some other Christian churches, the danger we face is that many of us have information about Christ, but we have not formed a transformative relationship with the God that we read about. You've got to know Jesus for yourself. You see, who Christ is to me dictates who I am to you and how I treat you because the love of Christ constrains me. Boy, I wish I had a witness in the building who was bold enough and honest enough to say that there was that co-worker on your job this week that if Christ wasn't in you, you would have been on them like white on rice on a paper plate in the middle of a snowstorm. But the love of Christ constrained you. Your fist was balled up. Your jaw was clenched and you almost knocked them out. But the love, have I got a witness in the building? The love of Christ constrains us. Who Jesus is to me dictates how I react to you. Our Christian practice should be based on our concept of Christ. Who he is. What has he done? Why did he do it? There's no way to declare that you are a Christian if you don't have a concept of Christ. It is impossible to combine the practice of Christianity together with the concept of Christ without understanding what salvation and the church is all about. The fact of the matter, whether you agree with me or not, is that we are living in a day and age where people are leaving the church without regrets. I remember when I was growing up, when folk, when folk left the church, they felt that void. They felt that gap. They left, but they kept looking back. They left, and they'll still come to the picnics. They'll still come to vacation Bible school. They'll still kind of hang around because they were hurt, and they didn't know how to handle their hurt. And so they did it by leaving. But now, folk are leaving and not even looking back. Y'all bear with me now. I got a little pedigree. Been Adventist all my life. Never went to public school, had been his education from kindergarten all the way to college. I know what I'm talking about, y'all. We fight about music. We fight about dress. We fight about diet. And many times we try to clean fish that we have not even caught. The danger that the Christian church faces in 2016 is that many of us are guilty of trying to make religious clones instead of Christian disciples. You got to eat like me. You got to walk just like me. You got to talk like me. We're, 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 we're trying to make clones. We hold dear many unbiblical traditions above thus saith the Lord. We are identified by our traditions rather than our concept or better yet our connection to jesus christ i can't wait for the day when the seven day adventist church will be known not just for what we believe not just for what we do and what we don't do i look forward to the day and i believe it's coming where we'll be known as those people if you need a prayer you go to them adventists if if you need healing go to them adventists they they're so connected to god and don't get me wrong, understand, beloved, that having traditions is not the problem. Y'all hear me in the building? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with traditions. There's nothing wrong. Uh, uh, you might not believe me, but there is no text in the Bible that says that you have to wear a white shirt and white tie at communion. You could search from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find that text. I guarantee it. That is not Bible. That is a tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that tradition. Amen? 
The problem with, is not having traditions. The problem is when traditions have you. The, 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 the problem is when you Christian folks say, oh, you're sitting in my seat. Jesus says, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. And can I let you know today that uh, people, including our young people, are sick and tired of us trying to indoctrinate them without introducing them to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, um, um, EGW, uh, my, my favorite author, says in the book Ministry of Healing that what the world needs now is the same thing they needed almost 2,000 years ago, a glimpse of the power of Christ. She went on to say that Jesus did more healing than he did preaching. He met people where they were, dealt with their situation, and then he bade them come. We need to quit taking up our community's parking once a week but providing no help for our communities you gotta wonder to yourself if god forbid this was the last time this church was able to meet in this fashion would the community be mad if for whatever reason these doors would close for the last time today would the community start to pick it and riot and say y'all better open up that church again because that church is our lifeline that church is where we go for peace of mind that church has been keeping us and helping us through the way or are we so irrelevant to our community that the doors were closed and they won't even notice? In our passage of scripture today, we discover that it was about a week before Jesus would be crucified. For the first time in his ministry, Jesus presented himself to Israel as their rightful king who was to sit on the throne of David. Jesus, Jesus later acknowledged the title king of the Jews, but he hastened to add that his kingdom was not of this world, but the Jewish leaders refused to accept him as their king. Jesus knew that this episode would lead to the cross, but still he went through with it because it was necessary for the eyes of all men to be turned towards him in the closing days of his life so that all would understand the significance of his mission on earth. So the Bible says that Jesus sends two of his disciples on an errand. Their task was to go and get a donkey. And I could imagine that their emotions were stirred up on the inside. They were excited about what was about to happen. Finally, Jesus will take his place as king. But they had to realize that their rejoicing was premature because they didn't really understand what was about to happen. They thought that Jesus was going to tear up the Roman Empire and establish a Jewish kingdom. But what they had to realize was that the kingdom that Jesus came to establish was not of this world. Jesus came to establish a different kingdom that was contrary to what they expected. The very animal that Jesus requested suggested that this wasn't an ordinary king because the custom was for a king to ride through the city on a horse. But Jesus requests a donkey, the symbol of humility. Jesus came into Jerusalem as king. But notice he doesn't go to the courts or to the palace on a prancing horse, but he goes to the temple on a donkey. Why? Because Jesus was establishing a spiritual kingdom. Jesus wanted them to know that this will be a different kingdom. They expected a kingdom that would say eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But Jesus came along and said, turn the other cheek. In the midst of people who are divided based on social stratification, a society where everybody's goal was to be large and in charge, Jesus comes along and says, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Jesus was setting up a different kingdom. A kingdom that said blessed are the poor in spirit. A kingdom that said blessed are the pure in heart. A kingdom that said blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was setting up a different kingdom. And most of us have plans for this life. And so often we get so caught up trying to achieve comfort down here. But let me, let me remind you that this world as we know it is not our final home. 
We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We're traveling through this foreign land. The old soul said, I've got a mansion. Just over the hilltops. Uh, in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we'll never more wander. But walk the streets that are pure as gold. Beloved, we need to learn to live with a heavenly purpose. And not just an earthly one. For it is Jesus that said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto thee. What a waste it would be to spend all this time coming to church every Sabbath. What a waste it would be to get the guy or girl of your dreams. What a waste it would be to get the nicest house and the best car you can buy. What a waste it would be to get your bachelor's degree, your MA, your MD, your PhD, your DVD, and every other D. What a waste it would be to gain the whole world and lose your soul. In the same way Jesus had a mind that was fixed on things above, we ought to store up our treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. We should never be so concentrated on the temporal that we miss out on the eternal. So Jesus comes riding, riding through on a donkey. The way they thought he would come, he didn't. The kingdom they thought he would establish, he wouldn't. But yet and still, as he passed by, the people cried, Hosanna to the son of David. They waved palm branches and said, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And let me pause here to say that we should never allow the verbal praise of our fellow man to get our heads swollen. Because Jesus understood that the same folk that were crying Hosanna will in a few days be crying crucify him. And I've learned even in my own life and ministry that sometimes the same people that shout amen on Sabbath will crucify you in the board meeting on Sunday. The same people that praise you to your face will dog you behind your back. But I thank God for a loving church. I thank God for real friends because a real friend is not somebody that only praises you in the good times, but they have enough love to tell you when you got food stuck in your teeth. A real friend tells you when your lips are a little chapter. Or your breath is foul. A real friend does not only deal with the high of good stuff. A real friend is able to tell you with love that you're wrong or you're in sin. And that you should look at this situation another way. That's what we need in church today. We need folk that will start praying P-R-A-Y and stop praying P-R-E-Y on each other. Folk that would quit smiling in people's face and gossiping behind their back. Somebody said, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. So here's Jesus. He's riding through the city. The people began, I want you to see this thing this morning. They began throwing their own garments. And they began to shout. Throwing branches before him. Hosanna! in the highest according to the greek translation of the text they repeatedly shouted hosanna which can be translated as save now or save i pray thee so the expression here may be considered a prayer to god that salvation may come to israel through the messiah king and so after this praise episode without any introduction and without any formal transition we find jesus in the temple and it doesn't take long to realize that something is wrong with Jesus. The book Desire of Ages paint the picture this way. It says, when Jesus walks in the temple, his eyes were pierced with burning anger and conviction. I can imagine his fists clenching and his face turning red. I can see veins popping out of his neck. As he takes in the scene, his anger begins to mount like a volcano that is about to erupt. And it is as if the divine terror and presence of God sweeps through the building. Has you ever got, have you ever gotten somebody you love mad? Just imagine this thing, y'all. This dignified savior, this healer, this redeemer, this lover and friend is now overwhelmed with anger and it literally looks like a volcano that is about to erupt and the lava of his anger seeks to destroy everybody in sight. The book says that divinity flashed through humanity. Investing Christ with a dignity and glory he had never manifested before. 
Those standing nearest to him drew as far away as the crowd would permit. Except for a few of his disciples, the Savior stood alone. Every sound was hushed. The deep silence seemed unbearable. Christ spoke with an anger, with a power that swayed the people like a mighty tempest. His voice sounded like a mighty trumpet through the temple. And he said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Your Bible still open? Clear your throat, lift your voice, read with me. Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13. Verse 12 and 13. The Bible says, and... And did what? And overthrew the? Uh huh. And the? Verse 13. Mm hmm. Yeah. Whose house, everybody? Shall be called? But? Now listen, when I read this text, it comforts me. But it also bothers me. It comforts me because it shows that Jesus was able to experience the same type of feelings that you and I experience. I love to read text that says Jesus wept. Because there are times that I weep. And I'm glad that I can relate to my Savior because as I weep, he could weep too. I love to read text that says that Jesus was tired and that he fell asleep on a boat because there's time that I feel tired and I fall asleep. Some of y'all sleep right now. But I thank God that I can relate to my Savior even in something as simple as sleep. I love to read text that says that Jesus was hungry. One time he and his disciples were so hungry that they picked grain on the Sabbath and I feel good because God knows that I be hungry. Especially on Sabbath when I'm trying to preach and I smell the food downstairs. Amen. <laughs> and I love to read texts like this. Because it shows that Jesus was able to be angry. And God knows there are times when I get angry. But this text shows me that even in our anger we should not sin. Because Jesus never sinned. But he did become angry. These kinds of texts come from me because it shows me that not only Jesus, not only was Jesus 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And he understands you and I because he felt what you and I feel. He's been there, but not only does it comfort me, it also bothers me. It bothers me because I was privileged to be raised in a church with some of the best Sabbath school and vacation Bible school teachers, with some of the best Pathfinder and Adventure directors, and some of the best AY leaders who taught me that Jesus was loving, and they taught me that Jesus was kind and forgiving and merciful. But what bothers me is that this image of Jesus was never presented to me while growing up. Then this passage of scripture was almost new to me. I was used to the Jesus that blessed babies. I was used to the Jesus that turned water into wine. I was used to the Jesus that healed all women and, and raised folk from the dead. I was used to the Jesus that cast out evil spirits and spoke to the winds and the waves and said, peace be still. But who is this Jesus that burst into the temple of God and straight tears stuff up? I must admit that I acknowledge that after careful study of this text, I've come to conclude that we need to talk a little bit more and teach our children about this type of Jesus that you shouldn't play around with. Because in some of our homes and in some of our churches, we've watered him down and there's been a general lack of respect for the power and the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, we ought to teach our children that he's graceful and we ought to teach them that he's loving. We ought to teach them that he's kind and merciful and forgiving. But we must also let them know that when he sees that enough is enough, he has no problem stepping in and tearing the place apart. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God, the same God that stepped out on nothing, and spoke to nothing, and nothing became something. The same God is in the world today. He is the God that blesses. He is the God that delivers. He is the God that heals. He is the God that forgives. But sometimes, He's the God to tear stuff up in your life uh, so that you can stand still and know that he is God and God all by himself.
himself. Uh, he don't need permission from any elder. He don't need permission from any pastor. He don't need permission from any deacon or any usher. He said, my house. My house. So here we see Jesus. Even though he was perfect and sinless, we find him displaying this violent compassion. He overturned tables in his anger, yet somehow he remained righteous. And this has a lesson for us. You and I, Christians, need to learn how to display our anger without hurting people. As I read this passage of scripture, a few significant questions came to my mind. And I want to examine them briefly before I take my seat. The first question I ask myself is, if Jesus were to come into some of our churches today, would he be happy with what he sees? Or would he tear the place up and turn over some pews in the church building? The, 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 the fact of the matter is that, listen to me today, some churches that were started to help people find their way back to God, they exist now in a form that makes it hard for people to find him. So often, our religious rules, our traditions, our church culture, it ends up turning people away. So often we find ourselves so busy in exchanging and maintaining that the people out there become invaluable to us in here. And the people that we're supposed to usher into the kingdom of heaven, oftentimes they become unnoticed and it's in many cases ignored while we're in here fighting over petty things like music and next year's nominating positions. We've got to understand, beloved, that our worship and our gatherings should be designed for people who are not even here yet. Oh, I wish I could talk to somebody in the house today. Let me try it again. Our worship and our gatherings should be designed for people that aren't even here yet. It, it gets dangerous when the Christian thinks the Christian church begin to think that it's all about you. Three sets of people should be considered in your worship. God first. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you got to put God first. You know, you see, the problem is that we, we, we're, living in, we, we're living in a generation that trains us to be selfish. It's all about you. You got your iPod, your iPad, your iPhone, your iWatch, your i this, your i that. You get in your car, you turn on what I want to hear. And so then you come to church and want to dictate what's going to be sung. Because you think it's all about you. God ought to be first on consideration when it comes to our worship. Does this please God? And if the story of Cain and Abel doesn't teach us anything else, it teaches us that just because it's worship does not mean God has to accept it. Hey, hey, both of them, both of them brought sacrifices. But one was accepted and one was rejected, which means that there is worship that is acceptable in the sight of God. And there is worship that is rejected in the sight of God. And so the first question in our worship, in our choreography of our worship, we must ask is, is this pleasing to God? And then the second group of people that, ought to, that it ought to please are those who are not even here yet. Yeah, you, 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 you thought it was God first and me second. But no, no, no. It ought to please God first and then it ought to be appetizing for those who are not even here yet. Now, I know some of you super saints can't wait to shake my hand at the door and try to correct me. But that's why I said God first. God first. Those who are not even here yet. And finally us. Amen. Every music don't work in every church. And there's music that is right and appropriate and acceptable, but it just doesn't work in certain churches. Amen? And so, uh, it, it, it has to fit the personality of the church. Am I making any kind of sense to us today? And, and for those of you who think it's going to be quiet in heaven. When I read down in Revelation, I read of 24 elders. 
with 24 crowns on their head. And at the feet of Jesus, they cast their crowns down. And the last time I checked, crowns don't fall quietly, especially 24 of them. When I read about heaven, I read about angels that cry, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I, I read of heaven and, and I hear about the song that we'll sing. Uh, that the, the, the songwriter says, when I sing redemption story, uh, angels will fall their wings. Uh, for they have never felt the joy that our salvation brings. We're told there'll be three surprises in heaven. Those folk that you, you know, had the biggest Bible and always had their hand up at Sabbath school. Not y'all, you know some other folk. And you thought they were going to be there, you're going to look around, you're not going to see them, that's surprise number one. And then the person that you were judging and criticizing and ostracizing and marginalizing and you look around you see them that's surprise number two and then you're gonna look around and see that hey wait a minute i'm here that's surprise number three here and i don't know about you i'm gonna shout thank you jesus thank you <laughs> so you got to understand the history of this text understand that to a jew a gentile was of no importance to them so notice this situation took place in the court of the Gentiles. But before I go any further, let me ask my second question. What made Jesus angry anyway? Here we find that they were in church. Now normally that's a good thing. Hebrews 10 25 tells us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. The Bible even says in Luke 4 16 that it was Jesus's custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath to preach but not today what Jesus saw in the temple was beyond words he had to move to action he said listen I'll talk but I'm finished uh, but I gotta move folk out of the way he overthrew tables he put the animals out he put the leaders out he cleaned the place out and said my house shall be called a house of prayer so why are you angry jesus uh you see uh, i had to realize that they were struggling in this text with a mindset and a mentality that is plaguing the church today it's called the temple mentality walk with me today let me do a little teaching before we do the preaching amen understand beloved that god's original intention was for there to be a tabernacle and not a temple walk with me oh, I'm, I'm gonna prove I'm gonna prove what I'm trying to tell you because if it ain't the word it doesn't deserve to be heard uh, but if it's in the book we ought to take a look it's not about what the preacher said it's about what the preacher read and the more you know is the more you grow amen God's original intention was for there to be a tabernacle and not a temple how do I know because I read Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8 where God said let them make me a sanctuary and the word sanctuary is synonymous with the word tabernacle they mean the same thing it means a safe haven he said let them build me a tabernacle that I may dwell among them so in the Old Testament, for the most part, we find that they worshiped in a tabernacle. Somebody say tabernacle. By the time we get to the latter part of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see no longer a tabernacle, but now we see a temple. Somebody say temple. And so you got to ask yourself, where did the temple come from? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we all know the story. One day David was sitting in his palace and observing the beauty of his palace. David began to feel bad that he was living in this big, beautiful palatial mansion while the ark of God was dwelling in a tent. So David, because he, was, he had become so wealthy, he felt bad that he's living so comfortably and the ark of God is in a tent. So he came up with a good idea and said, God, why don't I build you a temple? God basically told David, listen, I'm fine where I am, but if you want to build a temple, go ahead. But all, we all know that David was not allowed to build a temple himself because he had too much blood on his hands. And so his son Solomon built the temple. So you got to see the picture now. Walk with me, y'all. Don't let me lose you. Uh, before the temple, there was the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent. What was it, everybody? It was a tent. It was, it was movable. It was a flexible structure. But then in the New Testament, there was a temple. Uh, the temple had a foundation. The temple was unmovable. Uh, Jesus tore up the temple. 
But he never tore up the tabernacle. Why is that? You've got to understand, see this thing, tabernacle, tent, flexible structure. It was, it was characterized by being dependent on the move of God. Cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. When God moved, we moved. And we set up camp there. And then when he stayed, we stayed. And then he'll move again. We'll pick up the tent and move. And set up camp there. And when he stayed, we stayed. Then the cloud moves again. We move. And set up camp there. And we stay when he stayed. And so the temple was a characteristic of the movable nature of God. The tabernacle. That's what the Bible says. Exodus chapter 40 verse 34 through 38 tells the spirit of God to let the children of Israel as a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Wherever the spirit went, they went. And when the spirit stayed, they stayed and pitched their tent there. But then here comes David's idea to build a temple. The temple was a permanent structure. It was a building with a foundation. It was stationary and unmovable. But the temple came with an attitude birthing this temple mentality. You see, what David had to realize and what we need to understand today is that we should never bring our plans to God and say, God, hear my plans. Will you bless them? We need to pray and say, God, would you please guide me by your spirit to what you've already blessed? And when I'm in your blessing, God, I'm not moving until you move. And I'm staying as long as you stay. I'm not moving until I receive a word from God. Now, 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 let me put this here because again, I got I got I got to preach to to everybody, including the super saints who love to correct people at the door. Let me let me preach to you too and say thank God today. Hear me that whether tabernacle or temple, the Bible says that wherever two or three are gathered, touching anything concerning Him, that God is in the midst of bless. Anybody glad about that today? So, 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 I'm just all I'm doing today is giving you some history. Amen. No need to crucify me. I'm just giving you some history. Now, wherever you are, God can step into your situation. Whether you're at home, whether you're in the tabernacle, whether you're in the temple, whether you're in the hospital. Thank God that he's not the God that just sits up high and looks down low. Thank God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prove to us that every now and then God will step into your condition and put air condition in your condition. Wherever God shows up, he makes the place holy. God told Moses, take the shoes off of your feet for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Can I let you know the bush wasn't holy before God got there? And here it is for those of you that think that ain't nothing wrong with, with, with messing with that, the weed and stuff. The bush wasn't holy after God left it either. All right, get ready for me to get you mad. Understand, beloved, that the church building is not holy. Oh, no, 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 hear me, hear me today. We need it to do ministry, but the only time it's holy is when the holy presence of God is in it. The, 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 I remember I remember we got burned out of our church some years ago and we had to rent a church that worship on Sundays and there were folk that were so ignorant that they won't go in that church can I let you know that when Jesus comes again all of this is going to burn listen listen hear me hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not invest in the building I believe that God uh, we ought to give our best to the master and I believe that our, our place of worship ought to be beautiful and it ought to be comfortable um, but please understand that this is all going to burn As a matter of fact the Bible says that you are the church it says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost one of these days all these buildings are going to burn but we have to learn that we should never invest more in the church building than we invest in people because that makes Jesus angry but there's often watch this there's often a mindset that can prevent and pervert the move of God so what makes what made Jesus mad is this mindset of churchianity over Christianity that plagued the temple back then but the question is is this mentality still around today oh yes it is 
Now, Pastor, I'm going to need a strong deacon to escort me out today. Because it's good. Oh, yes, it is. That, that's why you hear people saying things like, well, I've been in this church for 30 years. And we've done it this way for 30 years. And we're not changing from, or from moving or doing it this way. Because we've been doing it for the past 30 years. That could only work in the temple mentality. Because when you have a tabernacle, it was constantly moving. You can't say you've been in for 30 years. We just pitched the tent last week. And by next week, we're going to be somewhere else. But when the temple came along, it started to have this concept, this idea of, 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 uh, self, uh, uh, this idea that came of that, that came along with it of, 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 you know, where folk just felt entitled. Hmm. What plagues the church? Not this church. Some other churches. Is that we're no longer moved by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now church is based on our own agendas, our own rules, our own traditions, some of which are not even biblical. So that if it's not in the bulletin, it's not going to happen. Who cares if the Spirit impressed your heart to give a testimony in divine hour? We didn't put it in the bulletin, so it's not going to happen. We, we didn't rehearse this song, so we can't sing it for praise and worship. Who cares if the words would encourage somebody and give them strength for the week? We didn't practice it, so we can't sing it. We, we, we find that some of our services are so choreographed to match what other churches are doing rather than being pleasing to God Almighty. But it gets even deeper than that. As I said before, all of this happened in the court of the Gentiles. Listen, listen, listen. The temple leaders began to, they became so consumeristic in their thinking. In other words, they tried to make a profit off the work of the Lord. So they came up with a good idea, not a God idea, but a good idea. And y'all excuse me, but I got to always remind my boy, not every good idea is ordained by God. Yeah, you got some good ideas, but if God ain't in it, I don't want nothing to do with it. Can I let you know that not everything that is right is righteous, uh, and not everybody that's called was called by God? Am I talking to anybody in the house today? So listen, listen, the temple leaders, they realized that people had, uh, it was difficult for people to travel from far away with their bulls and sheep and doves and pigeons to sacrifice to the Lord. And so watch this, the temple leader's plan was that instead of you struggling trying to travel with an animal all this way, why don't you just bring your temple tax and we'll provide the sacrifice for you. So this is what ended up happening. Those with more money got the bigger, better sacrifice. Those with less money got the less valuable sacrifice. And those with no money found themselves on the outside. They couldn't even get into the temple. So this is what Jesus saw when he's pulling up to the temple. He saw people that needed an encounter with God that wanted just to get into the temple to worship. But because they were not valuable to those inside the temple, they were on the outside. The Jews were so busy doing their own thing that the Gentiles, the sick, the lame, the blind, and the cripple that wanted to worship ended up outside the temple. Could it be that many of us today are so busy doing our own thing that the folk that need to worship ends up outside, overlooked and ignored? Could it be? That in some of our churches today, people are more concerned with the carpet and the curtains and the instrument and the equipment so that they don't even have room to care for those outside. You see, too many of our churches invest more into the church building than we invest in people. I'm tired of hearing folks say, well, we can't afford to do evangelism this year, but they got the newest and most costly equipment in their church. Could it be? That people are so busy campaigning for next year's position that we overlook the work of the Lord. Could it be that we have where we only value the contributions of certain folk in church and ignore everybody else? Could it be that we're so busy fighting each other and holding grudges against each other that we forget to fight the enemy of our souls? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And there are folk dying out there to a Christless grave while we're having church as usual in here. 
We've even put Jesus out of the Laodicean church. And I told you this week, for those who were here, examine the seven churches of Revelation. No matter how messed up the church was, Jesus was in it. But by the time you get to the seventh church, the Laodicean church, that history tells us represents the time period in which we live. Somehow Jesus is outside. And he's knocking trying to get in. He said, you think you're rich and increasing goods and have need of nothing, but you must realize that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind. We need Jesus in our church today. You see, Jesus is not concerned with what you have and what you don't have. Jesus is not concerned with Dr. So-and-so and and the person that didn't finish school. Jesus is not concerned with where you live or what kind of car you drive. Jesus is not concerned with what particular sin you're struggling with. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What bothers me in 2016 is that people will sit in pyramid schemes, people will sit in business meetings, people will sit in sorority meetings and all these meetings that provide temporal value and satisfaction, but they don't want to sit in church that provides eternal and salvific value. And I'll tell you why. People hear me today and hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not. People are tired of churches that provide this one day a week show. They, they, they are tired of joining churches, paying tithes and offerings, but not feeling loved. Nobody helps them when they've lost their job or when they're about to be put out of their home. People are tired of church as it is and they're yearning for a little bit more Christ. And the fact is that not, it's not that people are not interested in going to heaven. Everybody want to go to heaven. But people are tired of hypocrisy in church. They say they don't want to join because there's too, much, too many hypocrites in the church. But I'll tell you, there's always room for one more, so come on in. I'm telling the saints all week, if you find a perfect church, don't join because you're going to mess it up. Don't you know there's hypocrisy everywhere in the world? Once people are involved, there would be hypocrisy, insufficiency, and imbalance. In the club, there's hypocrisy. Yeah, brother, she'll dance on you, but but she'll make you buy her a drink and take your money, but she don't love you. If you want to avoid hypocrisy, you need to stay by yourself in a corner somewhere. And still there'll be a hypocrite there. People are tired of the lack of love in church. Many times people come in and out of church without being noticed. Even the way we eat sometimes show where our minds are. Now li- listen, listen, listen y'all. Again, I gotta, which one of y'all is the strongest one? <laughs> listen, I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm really not trying to tear your stuff up. I'm just trying to open our eyes so we can see. Uh, so we can see the way we do things. Some of us, we've been doing it for so long, we don't think about the way we do things. Um, um, but what I'm trying to prove to the church today is that this temple mentality is plaguing the 2016 church. And, and this is why church is not as effective as it used to be. So I'm not saying that, that, that you got to change anything because Pastor Kelly said so. I'm just trying to show you and uh, make you aware of what we do when we don't even realize it. Look at the way we eat. The leaders, we sit on the stage. (laughs) Hear me, hear me, hear me. We got silverware, we got glass cups, Um, we got the breaking dishes. And the visitors and the folk we want to join our church, they're in some corner somewhere with paper plates and plastic forks. And hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm not sorry. I do believe that we ought to show our leadership. We ought to show them appreciation for the hard work they do. But we've got to look at the ministry of Jesus and say, would Jesus sit on a stage with, with, with the silverware while those who we want to join the church are in some corner somewhere? We, 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 the Christian church needs to reconstruct our thinking. 
I told my church five years ago when I got there, I said, don't nobody serve me. I didn't come to get served. I came to serve. I tell them if everybody else going to wait on line, I'm going to wait on line too. Now listen, when in Rome, you know, y'all saw me sit down and wait last week. I'm not trying to tear your stuff up. I'm trying to, I'm, you know. But listen, people, people, people are seeing these things. And, and, and while it's normal and customary to us, it doesn't make sense to those who are not a part of it. People are tired of folk who know that they're sinners, but they act better than everybody else. They're tired of coming to church and, 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 and folk in church act like we got little wings sprouting out our backs. Like if we're, we're just God's gift to humanity. Folk in church judging each other, trying to look more righteous than everybody else. Listen to me. You're not righteous because you know a lot of Bible. The devil can out Bible any of you any day. He could out him you. He could sing all parts at the same time. It's not that people are not interested in going to heaven. They're not interested in us. Somebody said the Christian army is the only army that shoots down its own wounded. Yeah, we, we, we always want people to get what they deserve, but we forget that if God would ever give us what we deserve. People are tired of churches that are so obsessed with rules and traditions, but do not display love. And we should never put a rule or a tradition above people and their feelings. That makes Jesus angry. What am I saying? Let me, let me close so before, before y'all crucify me today. Let me, let me close. All, all, all I came to say is that rules, laws, doctrines have their place. But they must never become more valuable to us than people and their needs or else we will be just like the Jews in this text. You see, the rule said not to touch a leper, but when they came to Jesus, he hugged and embraced them. You remember the woman caught in adultery? The rule said stone her, but Jesus forgave her and said go and sin no more. And sometimes our own man-made rules causes us to discipline those who God already forgave. So I got to ask the Christian church in 2016, would Jesus be welcomed here? Can I remind you that it was the religious folk that killed him? Yeah, it wasn't the, the, the plot to kill Jesus wasn't hatched in city hall. It was hatched in the temple. Don't get me wrong. I do believe that the church should deal with sin. And I believe we should deal with it when we know about it, not when we've heard about it. You remember those 10 lepers that came to Jesus? But only one turned back to say thank you and he's the one that received the blessing. You see the rule was to go show themselves to the priest but he was so grateful for the word of healing that he couldn't help but turn back and say thank you and he's the one that received the blessing. And you've got to understand that a rule has never saved anyone. A law has never saved anyone. A doctrine has never saved anyone. We are saved because God loved us enough to send his only begotten son so that while we were yet sinners Christ Christ died for us. We were saved because Jesus cared enough about us to humble himself and put on flesh. We're saved because Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. For me he bled and for me he died. His love kept him on the cross. That's why the songwriter said, alas and deed, my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he devote his sacred head for someone such as i we're saved because early sunday morning jesus rose from the grave with all power in his hands i serve a risen savior he's in the world today i know that he is living whatever man may say i see his hands of mercy i hear his voice of chair and just the time i need him have i got a witness he's always there he lives he lives christ jesus lives today he walks with me he talks with me along life's narrow way he lives salvation to impart you ask me how i know he lives he lives within my heart
our duty in 2016 is to allow people to experience the unconditional love of Christ through us despite their situation despite their devastation despite their deprivation despite their aggravation despite their molestation despite their divorce despite their prison history despite their children born out of wedlock despite their past we need to show them that Jesus loves you Jesus tore up the temple threw out the uptight leaders and said my house shall be called a house of prayer is the house of the Lord a house of prayer or is it a house of judgment is the house of the Lord a house of prayer or is it a house of gossiping is the house of the Lord a house of prayer or is it a house of fighting Notice that despite the way the Jews and temple leaders treated the Gentiles and the sick folk, they stayed outside. Why, why, why didn't they go home? You see, I, I learned when you don't want me around, I'm going to go home. But they stayed there. They didn't go anywhere because they knew that eventually Jesus will show up in the temple. And the fact of the matter is that there are folk who have left this church, but they really haven't gone too far. Look at your yearly picnics and you'll see them. Look at Sabbath school and vacation Bible school. You'll see them drop off their parents, their children. They're, 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 they left, but they didn't go too far. They're lingering around because somehow deep down they know that Jesus will soon manifest himself in his church. Somehow they know that the latter rain power will one day be poured out on the church and it will not be the same. And so they haven't gone anywhere. And when we lift up Jesus in our church and stop lifting up self, stop lifting up unbiblical traditions, stop lifting up people's past sins and mistakes, stop lifting up people's past accomplishments, let your boasting be in the Lord. Put aside the gossiping, put aside the malice, stop acting saved and start working on true salvation through Christ. They will to see Jesus in the church and Jesus said if I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me lift up his grace lift up his mercy lift up his love lift up his forgiving and transforming power lift him up the risen savior high amidst the waiting throne lift him up this he that speaketh now he bids you flee from wrong so after the uptight leaders were moved out of the way, the real praisers were able to come in. Oh, when the saints go marching in, a uh, saint is nothing but a sinner who fell down but got back up. Notice that these were people who were demon possessed, people who were lame, people who were blind, people who had legitimate problems. They all came marching into the temple because the bigger my problems is the bigger my praise. And they broke into a magnificent praise. But get this, they didn't even get healed yet. But they somehow knew that in order to get your blessings, in order to get your healing, in order to get your deliverance, I'm not talking to anybody in the house today, in order to get your breakthrough, you've got to first stop asking and then start praising. The bigger my problems, the bigger my praise. You've got to praise him in advance. You've got to learn to give God praise for things he had not even done yet. The Bible says, out of the mouths of babes and suckers, thou hast perfected praise if we want perfect praise in our churches i'm talking about praise that far surpasses lip service or vocal praise and worship i'm talking about a praise from deep within that shows itself in our lives from monday to tuesday to wednesday to thursday all the way to sabbath then we must show people the love of christ whether they may be where whoever they may be and whatever they might have done See, your praise confuses the enemy. When the devil has hit you with his best shot, and you can still come to church on Sabbath, 
bed on Wednesday and lift your hands and show the enemy that I can take a licking but I'll keep on ticking that confuses the enemy you gotta learn to praise God in advance praise him for giving you the husband that you've been praying for even though you haven't even met him yet praise him for the job you prayed for even though you haven't even applied yet praise him for your children's breakthrough even though they're not in church today praise him for your deliverance even though you can't see a way out right now you've got to praise him in advance praise him in the sanctuary the Paul said let everything 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 that has breath praise the Lord if you're breathing then you ought to be praising has God been good to you has he been good then praise him in the sanctuary I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually sanctuary Paul said rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice praise him in the sanctuary bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name praise him in the sanctuary lift up your heads all ye gates and be lifted up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in I was young but I'm older now never have I seen God's righteous forsaken never have I seen his seed begging bread praise him in the sanctuary he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty praise him in the sanctuary weeping may endure for a night Give him 
Jesus, Doug. Give y'all praise. All over the building. Praise the Lord. and you want to accept Jesus as your personal savior. I want to say a special prayer for you today. Wherever you are, you want to be baptized. You want to be rebaptized. You want to be you want to have Bible studies. Maybe you want to join this church by a transfer of membership or profession of faith. Would you raise your hand wherever you are? I want to say a special prayer for you. I want to say a special prayer for you. As a matter of fact, would you move out of your seat? Let me pray for you. I'm going to let you go, but I just want to pray for you. You want to say yes to Jesus today. Time after time, he's been calling you, and now he's calling you again. On the balcony, come on down. Let me pray for you. 
Let me pray for you. We're still, we're still, Jesus is still in the, in the, in the soul saving business. And I want to say a special prayer for you. Come on now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on now. People are moving. God, give God praise, y'all. Give God praise. Give God praise. sanctuary Lord but Lord we thank you for those who moved out of their seat and said that they've decided to go all the way with you and to not turn back in the name of Jesus we just seal these decisions in heaven above we pray oh God that you would wrap these precious souls up in your loving arms remind them that there is a hope that burns within our hearts hope in the coming of the Lord and Lord we pray that on that great getting up morning when the dead in Christ shall rise when we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. When the saints go marching in, I pray that everybody in the sound of my voice would be in that number. So we pray, Lord, that you would save us. Save us by your saving power so that you can receive us into your kingdom. Bless us, we pray, in the precious and high and holy name of Jesus the Christ. And all that believe said, amen. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. 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 I just want to, I just want the congregation to, to have a moment of quiet reflection. We are at this moment here with our brothers and sisters who have responded to this appeal. I know they were filling their cars up. We don't want to rush them. This is important. This is what this worship service was all about. Saving souls. 
And if souls are being saved, none of us should be in a hurry to go anywhere. And I want us to please, nobody move at this time. Nobody move. Let the Spirit of God marinate in your soul what you have just heard in this place. So I want you with your own thoughts, with your own words, just reflect upon what you have heard and experienced today. Talk to God. Let's do that now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hug somebody beside me and say, receive it in Jesus' name. You should know everyone that our evangelistic series continue this evening. We will continue at 7.15 p.m. sharp. And again, the word of God will be heralded from this desk by his manservant, Pastor Daniel Kelly. I want to invite you to not just come back, but invite a friend to come with you. And remember that I have some special tickets for Pastor Josian's 10th anniversary celebration of ministry. You can get one for free if you bring with you this evening five friends who have not been to the meetings yet. So let us stand at this time as we have the benediction. Pastor Bulgin will now lead us. Great God and Father of all mankind, we thank you, Father, for your word that was just preached to us. We glorify your name, we magnify your name because God, you are worthy. So Father, as we separate from here, we do not separate from you, Father God. But Father, may your Holy Spirit continue to guide us. As we go downstairs in fellowship, I pray, Father Lord, that you will bless the physical food that we will be partaking of. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
2016 at 6 p.m. sharp, and it's completely free. It's Gospel Fest 2016. Experience gospel music like you never have, featuring Pastor David Wright and the New York Fellowship Mass Choir. Sharp. And it's completely free.